Tourism is a big business in places like India with all of the usual famous attractions. But there are other types of tourism, ecotourism, medical tourism, and yes, sex tourism. We'll talk about the ramifications of that next on Global Perspectives. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Center at UCF. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. Think about the idea of a walk across the sun. Even as a mind game, it is uncomfortable, evoking feelings of pain, helplessness, and certain death. Yet, our guest today, author Corbin Addison, has chosen that idea as the title for his new novel, which exposes the horrors of modern slavery, particularly in India, that he has seen from the inside. Hello, Corbin. Welcome to the show. Hi there. Thank you for having me. Tell us how you got into this complicated, frightening, and fascinating field of, of human trafficking awareness. My background is in law, uh, engineering before that, but I was practicing law in private practice in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, and I had traveled widely. I had a concern about human rights, but didn't really know a heck of a lot about the subject. I think if you had asked me five years ago what I knew about human trafficking, I would have told you something like this. Uh, you know, I've heard about kids being sold into brothels in India or Cambodia. Um, if you'd asked me about the United States, I probably would have given you a very vague answer, <laughs> filling in the gaps from my ignorance. Um, but it was actually a film uh, that made it personal for me and my wife. We watched a film called Trade with Kevin Kline. It was a feature film. Uh, it was a hard film to watch, um, but it was an eye-opener for us. And we started talking about it. Um, and my wife later, a couple months later, had an idea for a novel um, that would humanize the subject in the same way that that film did for us. I had been writing on the side unsuccessfully, been searching for a story uh, that would take flight, and I saw in that my wife's idea um, something brilliant, um, but also something sort of terrifying, something overwhelming. Um, but I was willing at least to try, and what was cool is as soon as I started opening my mouth, people started saying, let me help you. It's really been a village project. So the book is a, a walk across the sun. And why did you choose to go the path of fiction versus something factual? Because you had lots of hands-on experience with this subject. What, what was the reason for your choice? Yeah, there were a couple reasons. I mean, one is, is I, I'm a novelist at heart. I love story. Um, and frankly, I, I don't really love the moniker fiction or the word fiction because it implies fantasy. Where the, the kind of fiction that I love is fiction that opens my eyes to the real world, but through a lens of story. Um, so I had been trying my hand at fiction, uh, writing stories for a number of years, and it was only natural for me to sort of take this subject and put it into that frame. Um, but there was also another reason, and, and that is, as soon as I got into the topic, I realized there's a tremendous amount already out there in nonfiction, wonderful books. So frankly, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, what I didn't see a lot of was a lot of stories that brought the subject into fiction or into the framework of story that would then be able to reach an audience that nonfiction might not necessarily reach. How do you start a project of this magnitude? Did you have a place you wanted to visit first? And you already knew that in advance, or did you kind of just work your way around the world trying to get the best experiences you could find? Yeah, um, honestly, when we first conceived of the project, uh, my wife and I had supported as much as we could uh, on a, you know, on what I was making, but we had supported a group called the International Justice Mission out of Washington, D.C. They work uh, in 14 or 15 countries around the world. They're a service agency, so they actually bring um, services like legal services to bear for the poor who are often being exploited by justice systems that are broken in developing countries. So one of the things they do is they rescue girls from brothels in places like India and Cambodia. That's why I would have been able to tell you that uh, before any of this happened. So when the idea came to my wife and she gave it to me, my initial thought was, I need to connect with IJM and see if they would let me in the door of one of their field offices 
and give me sort of a behind the scenes tutorial about what's going on on the ground. Um, I was able to connect with IJM and they were very gracious in opening the door for me on India, which then became sort of the locus of much of the story. What was the most horrifying thing that you learned uh, early on? Um, the, the most surprising thing to me was just the, how prolific this is in our own backyard. I mean, I was of course looking to go to India and then Europe and coming back to the U.S., um, but one of the, the most um, sort of memorable and, and hard interviews I did was actually the Department of Justice um, with a high-level official who was gracious enough to give me a couple of hours to bat around story ideas and tell me some stories from the field from his own work. And I just, I remember hearing stories from him that just seemed hard to believe because of their presence so close to home. They were stories from cities that I had visited in suburban areas that I had been to um, or that looked a lot like my own neighborhood. And when I started confronting that and dive deeper and realized that this is, pr this is prolific, it's all around us, it's a human problem, not a problem out there, um, I think that was the, the place at which it really sunk in that, that I'm doing something that's important and I need to help to en enlist everyone in this cause. It's something we all need to care about. Now, as time has gone by, have you found that more and more people at least are aware of the problem because you go back, you know, like you said, 10, 15 years, the number of people in the conversation was very small. No, that's exactly right. I mean, the, the awareness has really seemed to be snowballing. Um, it seems like the, the media is giving a lot of attention to the subject, whether it be CNN Freedom Project or regular editorials from Nick Kristoff at the New York Times um, and lots of sort of smaller level media outlets that are picking it up. Um, yes, I've, I've definitely noticed a rising level of awareness. At the same time, I think um, the reality is that our modern media is so soundbite focused that the level of understanding is very shallow. It's sort of like a reflecting pool for most people. So they might have heard of one little thing and it might have buried itself in very shallowly in their minds, but when you talk to them about the subject writ large, the lights still go on. It's like, wow, okay, now I'm understanding, whereas before I may have had a vague knowledge. The first part of your research took you to South Asia? That's, that's right. I, I, um, I actually did a, a six-week trip um, and spent most of my time in India. The book actually begins on the east coast of, uh, of India, south of Chennai, where the tsunami devastated the coastal areas back in 2004. So I went there to research the tsunami and met with so uh, a number of people who were actually swept away by the waves uh, and, and survived. So I, I did that research and then I went to Mumbai, took the cross-country train just like the girls in my book, and then spent a lot of time um, in Mumbai with IJM, uh, both in, sort of interviewing their people and experiencing what they were doing, um, going to court, going to, uh, going to safe houses and meeting the girls, and then ultimately taking an undercover brothel tour posing as a customer um, going into Kamatapura. Tell us about that. You can't just mention something oh, no, like that can't. without uh, going into detail. In that, right, exactly. You know, it, it, was a, it was an unforgettable experience and, and again, sort of took it to a new level of personal. Um, I'm, you know, as a white American, I was sort of uh, a standout spotlight figure in a sea of brown faces. Um, in Kamatapura, the, the, average, uh, the average customer is just the average Indian. Um, very few Westerners ever venture into that red light district. It's sort of the traditional red light area. I went with a guide who was an Indian gentleman who was an undercover uh, agent for an NGO that had been working on, on the subject, not, not International Justice Mission, but another one. Um, and he was generous enough to take me there. Um, he had friends, obviously. He had been doing this for some time. His job, I mean, his livelihood was finding tips to underage girls who were being hidden you know, in the upstairs rooms of these brothels and being sold every night. So um, he had the friends of the pimps and the brothel owners. They didn't want to let me in the door initially. They were afraid of me. They thought I was connected to the police, which was a valid concern given that a lot of white guys you know, and, and Westerners have been involved in that um, appropriately in helping the police track down these minor girls. But so we went upstairs, um, finally let me in, and I was there behind closed doors. Dro they drew the shades, and the brothel owner brought out the girls under the lights. There were seven or eight of them, um, and they just stood there. 
just looking at me or looking at the floor. And it was very clear. I mean, I just sat there and not really knowing what to do because I was there posing as a customer, supposed to be interested in having a good time. But I was terribly nervous and knew the danger of it. Um, at the same time, I was horrified by just sitting there and what am I supposed to do with these girls who clearly, from the looks on their faces, were not happy to be there. Ultimately, um, I just sort of sh waggled my head and declined to make a purchase and we left, went to another brothel um, and looked around and did the same thing and left. And I'll never forget shaking the brothel owner's hand. It was one of those moments where I felt morally compromised simply by being there and yet it was something that I needed to see, I felt, in order to write a credible story. Now, is it customary that somebody would come in and just be shopping as you appeared to be in this instance and there would be no suspicion about that? You know, I don't know what was going through the brothel owner's mind. I mean, I think he probably never dropped his suspicion of me. Um, at the same time, he trusted my guide. And my guide more or less shepherded me through the process. So when I looked uncertain, he was the one who jumped in and said, hey, well, why don't you show him around, you know, show him how clean the place is. So they actually took me back into the sex rooms, fluffed the pillows. I mean, it was like, you know, going into a hotel and having somebody show you the room and say, do you want it? Um, I mean, there were more girls back in the warren of sex rooms, and it was, it was definitely surreal. But without a guide, I don't know what I would have done. Frankly, it would have been too dangerous, and I could have gotten in a really sticky situation. But the guide, again, you know, kept me safe. What was the average age of the girls? You know, I asked the, the, my guide that question after we left. We went to dinner. Um, it, it's fascinating how the brothel district is there. It's, it's just like a place, like a neighborhood. And there are brothels everywhere. But then right on the outskirts, there are restaurants. I mean, there are, you know, other businesses that are licit businesses that actually cater to a lot of, uh, of the clients. And so we went to dinner and, and I asked him that question. He said, you probably didn't see a minor girl. He said, the reason for that is you're white and therefore you're the untrusted one. So they're not gonna show you their prize uh, unless you, know, you were somebody who was a repeat visitor who had already paid them and they, had, you know, they knew that you weren't gonna bring the police. So typically in India, they keep the minor girls in the attic rooms and they only give them to the good customers, the ones that uh, that are known to have deep pockets. You must have had a hard time yourself eating dinner after that experience. That just sounds like an odd combination. You witness something so awful and then yes. restaurants in the brothel district, that's... I know, it's, again, it, I, I keep using the word surreal. I mean, it really felt that way. Um, and then when I got on the, the local train to go back to the northern suburbs where I was staying, um, and of course the northern suburbs are very glitzy in many ways and look nothing like the brothel district. They're only a short train ride away. I mean, I'll never forget it was after midnight and I was just standing there in the, the open door and you know, the wind is blowing through the compartment that's mostly empty. And, and I just looked out at the sea of lights and I just had this sort of thought, I mean, what am I doing here? I mean, this is wild. I mean, this is unlike anything. I've traveled widely, I've never done anything approximating this. And really, you know, in my heart at that point, it just, it cemented the purpose of my mission. I wanted to take what I had seen, put it into a story that would then reach the average reader of fiction around the world and compel them to care. Now, at other places, was it typical that you were the only one from the U.S. or the West, or did you find other European and American customers at some of these, and, and you also mentioned Cambodia. You know, in Cambodia, about a third of the customers come from Europe and, and the U.S., so I imagine there you would have seen more people who looked like you. Yeah, yeah, I didn't go to, to Southeast Asia, but definitely that's my understanding, um, that there are a lot of sex tourists from the West, both from Western Europe um, and North America, and then, of course, there are tourists that come from Asia as well, from Japan and from uh, Southwest Asia, that is, sort of the Middle East. India, on the other hand, is predominantly, um, you know, the, the average buyer is the average Indian. What, what were your thoughts as you came out of this experience? Uh, obviously horrible, but um, you wanted to tell the story. Was it hard to write? In a way, the story almost wrote itself. It was, at least to the first draft, then the editing process was much more grueling. It went through many different stages before it was finally accepted for publication. Um, that I found is typical, but the original draft um, flowed pretty easily. I think because it was 
it was just a compelling thing. I mean, I've yet to run across a subject in all my, in my travels and my talking with people. Um, I've yet to run across a subject that, that most the average person finds so compelling. Once they wrap their minds around it and get it, and once it becomes personal, it's just such a, a compelling topic. Were you able to sit down and talk to victims and customers and others? You know, you said you shook hands with brothel owners, but what about the victims and the users? Yeah, um, I definitely was able to meet with a number of girls that had been trafficked and rescued from the brothels. Um, they were minor and boy, they were young looking. I mean, Indian girls naturally look a little bit younger to the Western eye um, than they actually are, but these were tiny girls. Um, they were in their, their young teens. And I mean, one of them had uh, gotten pregnant in the process and then she actually gave birth to a child and, and then put it up for adoption. Um, I was not actually allowed with the minor victims to talk to them about their stories. I was only able to talk to their caretakers. So I got their story secondhand while the girls waited in the room and looked at me shyly. The reason for that is they didn't want to re-traumatize them. Um, they live every day, obviously, with the memory of what happened to them, but part of the process of, uh, of helping them is giving them a different vision of the future that doesn't include uh, the exploitation of the past. So to have a white male come in and interview them in depth about exploitation is, was horrific, was something that, that their handlers did not uh, think was wise, and I was fine with that. There seems to be no end to this problem. The, the demand is insatiable, and, and with each passing year, there are more people enslaved in the 21st century. Have, have you been able to wrap your hands in your research around the psychology of this? What, what, what drives people towards this kind of activity, as, especially as customers? It's a great question. I mean, it's, it's an overwhelming thing, and one of the things that I asked myself from day one is I, I wanted to write a story, but I wasn't satisfied to write a depressing story. I mean, I wanted to write an honest story, a truthful story, but I wanted to give uh, my reader some vision of hope. Um, and that was partly for me as well as for the reader. I mean, I, as a human being, as a lawyer, somebody who cares about justice, I'm looking at this and just being overwhelmed. It's, it's like, you know, being deluged by something that's so horrific that I almost want to turn away, but I can't turn away. Once it's personal, you can't look back. Um, so answering that question was critical for me. I mean, the first sort of answer to the question that, that I got was a very specific sort of local answer. It was a quote from Mother Teresa when asked about global poverty, she just said, you know, I don't really think about that. I just do the thing that's in front of me. And of course, she made a tremendous amount of difference in the lives of real people, as is happening today around the world um, through the heroic efforts of NGOs and government agencies um, who are rescuing real children. Um, and I, I would hasten to mention adults, because of course, it doesn't become less horrific at the age of 18 to be included in, you know, to be enslaved. There was, in addition, sort of the layer that you mentioned, which is the global layer, sort of the, the bigger question, is this something we could defeat? Um, is this something, I mean, you just look at the tide and it seems like the numbers are increasing. It's the fastest growing criminal industry in the world. Um, it's being driven by demand. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a numbers game. The pimps and the traffickers aren't in it for the exploitation. They're in it for the fact they can make billions of dollars annually, and it's just going up. Um, so. In my mind, you know, the, the answer to your question is really simple. I mean, until we as a society realize that what is driving this, this horrific trade is not criminality per se, that is the pimps and the traffickers, the predators, we, we love to hate them and they should all be in jail, um, but is in fact uh, a demand for commercial sex that comes from us, it comes from men who look like us. One in six American men buy sex. That's, that's probably an understated number, given that it's not something most men will willingly admit. We need to, to realize that, and we need to ultimately have a, a cultural revolution. We need to have a change in a mindset um, in the way that we think about the purchase of sex in this country and, and around the world. And I think it's possible, but I think it's going to take a tremendous amount of work and a lot of voices speaking the truth. Now that you've been immersed in the topic for many years, what is your broad perspective about what the possibilities are? I know there are different points of view. Some people think that it is a problem that can be managed. Some are 
wildly optimistic and think that it can be abolished over a period of time. Where, where do you fall along the spectrum? What do you think is possible as far as addressing this threat? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I, um, I'm a lawyer, so I'm, I'm both uh, a, you know, a fact guy. I'm interested in, in you know, what is possible, not just what sort of is theoretically interesting. Um, and, and I'm also pragmatic in the sense that I'm willing to look at whatever works, um, you know, even if it might be something I'm initially leery of for whatever reason. So I've looked at the different models that have been tried um, by well-meaning people around the world, including you know, the full legalization of prostitution, which has been tried in a number of European countries, um, to a Swedish model, which is sort of an interesting blend of both legalizing the sale of sex to, to decriminalize the girl, the woman involved, or the male, uh, most cases it's women, but focusing the light on the men, including not just the pimps and the traffickers, but also the Johns, and then a full-scale sort of organized crime approach, which has been taken by the United States, sort of we, that we've minted that. That's our approach to the war on drugs. We're very good at it. It goes back to the days of Al Capone. Um, the reality is that there's only one country in, in the world that I can point to and say they have documented proof they've decreased human trafficking in the past decade. That's Sweden. Um, Sweden took an anti-demand approach and they, they went after the men. And, and that again included the Johns as much as it included the pimps and the traffickers. There are studies coming out of Harvard and other places showing that deterrence for a customer would actually be a pretty minimal thing. Something like putting their name in the newspaper would deter 80% because suddenly their wives and employers would find out what they're doing. They don't want that. Putting them in jail for one month in a study from Harvard in 2011, 100% of respondents said a one month in jail would stop me from buying. Taking their car away, car impoundment, 70% responded, I wouldn't go back. When you look at that, you realize these are not career criminals. It's not like deterring a drug trafficker. It's not like deterring you know, organized crime who've been in it for a long time. You gotta put them in jail for a long time and frankly, rehabilitation may not be possible for them. But for the Johns, it is possible. Sweden's proven it. It's just up to us as, as a society to say, you know what, we're going to make it uh, morally problematic and legally problematic to be a sex buyer. That's a choice we have to make. Now in our hemisphere, a lot of attention has been on Brazil for its efforts to combat trafficking and, and there have been some measurable gains, but, um, but you, you think Sweden offers the best example of sort of a comprehensive approach that has reduced the problem. Yes, I was just in Brazil recently actually and, and um, I had the pleasure, my book has been released there and, and it's done very well there and Brazilians do really care about this subject, um, which was exciting for me to see. Uh, there's actually a telenovela, what they call it's sort of their, their, their version of a soap opera, but it's really a primetime you know, TV show uh, that's coming out from a major writer um, you know, on this subject just this month. In fact, in fact it was just last month. Um, and so, yeah, it, Brazil is definitely taking the bull by the horns. Um, but as far as I know, um, I'm not aware of uh, any other country that can claim to see an overarching sort of, you know, meta level decrease in the problem. Of course, in Sweden, the reality is what they found is organized crime is leaving Sweden and going to Norway, right? There's displacement, but they can say within Sweden, we are starting to make strides on the subject. We're turning the tide against the traffickers, whereas everywhere else in the world that I'm aware of, we're seeing it increase. So I think Sweden has something to say. I think that it isn't perfect there. Their enforcement of their anti-purchase law has been more minimalist than I would have hoped for. So I think they have a lot more to do, but I think their approach is something that is salutary and is something we could learn from. Thank you, Corbin Addison, for joining us today. Sure, my pleasure, thank you. And thank you for Global Perspectives. I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Center at UCF.